give me men to match my mountains. The Challenge of Alaska. Sound exciting? It is. And there's a special type of person in Alaska. It's the licensed big game guide. We're at Fairbanks, Alaska, the gateway to the Arctic, the home of Leroy Schiebel, Master Alaskan Registered Guide. That distinction of Master Guide has been officially extended to only 20 of the more than 300 licensed Alaskan guides. And Leroy's experience as a bush pilot, predator hunter, and guide have won him the reputation as one of the leading authorities on the Arctic of Alaska. And did you ever wonder what kind of stories a professional guide tells? Alaska means many things. North America's highest mountain, timber, mining, Eskimos, 24 hours of sunshine, but above all, hunting and fishing. In fact, this is what lured us north. And after partially satisfying our own hunting desires, we began to outfit and guide other hunters into the bush country. During the 20 some odd years that we've been living, guiding and flying our bush planes in Alaska's Arctic, the everyday experiences become almost too hard to tell to someone else. In fact, sometimes even hard to believe. And that's why we began filming the true story that you are about to see. In the native tongue, Alaska really means the great land. And Alaska's Arctic is truly North America's last wildlife frontier. To be sure that we will continue to have an ample supply of game, we spend some of our off-season time hunting down destructive predators. In fact, we're right now getting ready to go up into the Arctic on a wolf hunt. Here, I'll show you where we're going. Right now, we're here at Fairbanks, and we're going to take our little bush airplanes and fly for about 100 miles over these mountains and cross the Yukon River and then a little farther, we pass the Arctic Circle. And we're going to camp with some Eskimos that uh, have a village right in the very heart of the Brooks Range here. We noticed the last couple of years that the wolf population in this area has been increasing to where it's beginning to endanger our sheep herds. So we're going up and see if we can sort of balance things out just a little bit. Uh, why don't you just buckle your seat belts and come along. Now that we have that out of the way, we'll get back and finish our packing. We're taking two airplanes because of the extreme danger involved in this type of flying. I'll be piloting one of the planes and also serving as cameraman. The rest of the crew will include Bud Wheezy, Gunner, Cleo McMahon, the other pilot, and Chuck Gray, cameraman, gunner, and also pilot. We take a plumber's fire pot so that we can preheat the engines of our planes in the extreme sub-zero temperatures that we encounter up there. We have to be completely self-sufficient up in the Arctic and take everything that we think we might possibly need, including a double sleeping bag for each man, a small tent, and plenty of rations in case of any kind of an emergency. Then we take a single barrel shotgun chambered out for the three inch buckshot magnum to shoot the wolves with. With our baggage compartment completely full now, Bud climbs in, but we find we still have a little gear left over. And it appears as though there's only one place left to put it. You'll notice that we're on skis, so we do not get the shock absorbing effect of rubber tires. This means that our landing gears take a terrific beating when we land on the rough terrain to pick up the wolves that we shoot. This is the month of March, which means that the sun has now returned to give us a good 12 hours of sunshine daylight. 
Also, the snow conditions are usually the deepest at this time of the year, which makes tracking the wolves a little bit easier. We're now flying over the foothills out north of Fairbanks and then across the mighty Yukon River, and then on up and penetrating the rugged Brooks Range. We have radio communications between the two planes at all times so that we will keep track of each other. And then occasionally we'll try to make visual contact to uh, reassure the general area that the other plane is in. It's very important that we stay together up in this area in case of emergency. Now we're coming into Anaktubik Pass where a very remote village of about 80 Eskimos are located. Here you'll notice the sod huts scattered around right in the pass. These people pretty well derive their living yet from the caribou herds and other wildlife in the Brooks Range. We land on a lake a short distance from the village and we're planning to stay here for a few days while we're hunting wolves. Some of the young people come out to meet us, and since the gun is their livelihood, the first thing these fellows wanted to see was our gun. You notice the heavy fur ruffs around the hoods of the parkas of these children. This is to protect their faces from the very bitter cold winds that blow constantly through the pass. The kids took us up to the village to meet their families, and here you'll see the sod huts just scattered around in any fashion. There's no streets or sidewalks in this town. We're about 30 miles farther north than any timber grows, so the houses have to be made out of sod blocks cut from the ground. Then they bank snow up around the outside real well to help insulate them against the cold. Then out in front, there's usually a skin drying rack where they dry and tan their skins to make their clothes out of. The only fuel in the area is the willow bushes that grow along the creeks. The only toys we saw the kids play with during our stay here were these little handmade sleds. And even the runners for the sleds had to be hand hewed out of logs that were hauled for 30 miles by dog team from down on the John River. They were very content kids though, and during our stay we never once seen any of them crying or fussing in any way. Here's a hunter coming in with a sled load of caribou meat, which will be good news for the village. When a herd comes through the pass, they go out and kill all they possibly can, and then butcher them up and put them down in their deep freeze to keep them during the time when there isn't any game in the area. The deep freeze is a hole chiseled down about 15 feet in a permanently frozen ground. Then at the bottom of the shaft is a room that opens up where they can store quite a pile of meat. This will keep the meat frozen even all summer. The next morning, we're out at the crack of dawn fire potting our airplanes again, and we can tell when the engine is warm enough to start by moving the prop. One morning at 65 below zero, we could chin ourselves on the prop without moving the engine at all. Our closest available supply of gas is over 100 miles to the south at a cost of a dollar a gallon. And it's very important that we have all the frost cleaned off of the wings good so that we can get maximum lift. It's a little over an hour's job every morning, getting the plane fired up and everything ready to go and so we can take off. Now we're ready to head out and look for the Arctic wolf. We concentrate our searching around the caribou herds that we're able to find and look for signs that the wolves have been working on the caribou. Once in a while we can just spot a pack of wolves tearing down caribou, but usually we have to find their kills and then pick up their tracks and track them down. We've spotted a kill now, so we're landing to see how fresh it is. We find that it's a cow caribou that the wolves have torn down, and all they've eaten is the tongue and part of the onborn calf. We've had Eskimo reindeer herders tell us that in the early spring, the wolves will single out the pregnant cows and eat only the onborn calf and then go on and kill another one. This is why the state of Alaska pays us a $50 bounty to kill these predators. Notice the vapor trail coming out of the exhaust of the plane at these extreme sub-zero temperatures. Now we've picked up the tracks along the shore of a lake, and then they're leading us out across the lake, and then on up the valley. We spotted three of the wolves now up ahead of us, which have seen us and are beginning to cut out of the country. We can do better shooting out of the wide open door on the right-hand side of the plane, but with 25 degree below zero air hitting us in the face at 60 miles an hour, it discourages much of this, so we usually have to shoot out of the window on the left-hand side. Notice that black one jumping up in the air just the shot hits him. 
apparently wasn't hit too good because it doesn't seem to slow him up much. After the first pass, we looked up the valley and we saw wolves running all directions. It appeared as though there was about 14 wolves in this pack altogether. We come in as low and as slow as we possibly can without stalling out. I can remember a few times when we were just a little bit too low and left ski tracks behind us. Not as easy to hit as it might seem. These scenes were taken at only about one-third of the normal speed, so things are really moving fast. Then sometimes they start this dodging operation, which makes it almost impossible to hit them. come in for a shot, we slip the plane in sideways so the gunner in the back seat can have a better forward shot at the wolf without hitting the propeller. Ah, oh, bud, you hit him in the rear end. One of the big troubles we have with our gunners is they always hit him in the wrong end. One year there was four hunters killed and five airplanes lost while wolf hunting, which is around a quarter of the total hunting force that year. Even though we've never cracked up an airplane ourselves, the risk still prevents us from getting any kind of insurance. This one made a sharp cut out to the left just as Bud shot, so another miss. They're getting into the mountains now, so we're going to have to really bear down and make every shot count. anymore now so we take a big wide sweep around the area to see if we can spot any more stragglers. Well the fun's over now so we have to land and start the skinning. We have a real nice soft fluffy landing field here down between the mountains where the been protected from the wind and the snow hasn't blown into big hard drifts. We're kidding Bud here just a little bit because this is the one he shot in the rear end. There's the big ivory hardware that the wolf uses to tear the caribou down. This is a nice light gray colored skin, which is the prime colors for the parka rough trims. Cleo's holding up the left foreleg bone, which we turn in to collect our $50 bounty. A hide like this is worth an additional $50, which makes it a $100 wolf. We lay our frozen lunch in on the hot engine of the airplane, which thaws it out, and then we have a nice, warm, toasty sandwich to eat. the cupcakes didn't quite get thawed out. We looked up on the hill and saw a little black spot move, which turned out to be a wolf. So we hid behind the airplane to stay out of sight, and apparently it was a straggler from the pack that was coming back to join the rest of them. We waited till he got on down within rifle range, and then Chuck got his rifle out and lowered the boom on him. We have to approach them with great caution because we can never be completely sure when they're dead. 
One time we had one of them playing dead and it jumped up at one of our hunters and almost got him before he was able to stop him with another shot. We had 12 dead wolves scattered around the country, so apparently only a couple of them got away all this pack. If we're going to be stopped very long, we put our open sleeping bag over the engine to hold the heat in so it'll stay warm. Then we fold it up and make a seat cushion out of it while we're traveling so we can conserve all the space we possibly can in the little cub. It broke through the crust on top and then really got bogged down. It was just all the four of us could do to get it going and get it up out of there again. time we killed him, so we had to land up on top. We're photographing this landing slow motion so you can see the terrific beating our landing gears take at some of these landings. You notice here the plane bouncing completely off the ground. I had to walk down over the brow of the hill a little ways to pick up this nice gray skin, which would be about a $45 skin plus the $50 bounty. While we were stopped there, this little red fox came out to see just what in the world all the commotion was about. We don't bother the fox because they don't bother the other wildlife other than the ptarmigan and other small game, which are quite plentiful up in the Arctic. The ptarmigan are about the size of a partridge and turn white in the winter months and brown in the summer months to blend in with the terrain. And are actually very good eating. <laughs> it looked like a storm was moving in on us, so we hauled all the wolves into a central location and buried them in the snow to keep them from freezing until we could get back the next day to skin them out. The storm completely drifted in all of our tracks, so if it hadn't have been for a wolverine feeding on one of the wolf carcasses when we got back the next day, we may not have been able to find them. The wolverine have a very valuable fur, so Chuck landed first and jumped out with a rifle and clobbered him. Wolverine is the prized fur to put around the inside of the parka hoods because the moisture from your breath does not freeze to the wolverine hair like it does to the other furs. A prime skin like this is worth about $45 to $60. The storm drifted in a real hard crust of snow over the top of our wolves, which made a little problem digging them out again. By burying them in the snow like this, the only part that will freeze is the feet and the tail and the nose, so we can still skin them out pretty well. A full-grown wolf carcass like this will weigh as much as 150 pounds. Incidentally, the aroma that comes off of these things after they've laid overnight is really something to behold. Now we're heading back into Fairbanks to bounty the wolves that we've gotten. We give the fish and wildlife agents all the information we can about the other wildlife we've seen in the Arctic, and also the information about the color ratios and sex ratios of the wolves we've killed. Then the other agent's cutting off the left foreleg bone, which we have to turn in to collect our $50 bounty. Then he cuts a hole in the left ear to mark the skin. A large wolf skin such as this will measure about seven feet long from nose to tail. It took three very large skins like this to make the black wolf skin parka that I have. This is just about the warmest thing known to man and has kept me warm in temperatures as low as 65 degrees below zero. We got back just in time to take in the Winter Carnival, which is highlighted by a 70-mile sled dog race split up into three days. While the dogs are out on the trail, the rest of us are occupied in several other interesting events that are going on at the same time. Some of us like to play baseball and snowshoes. prefer a pair of skis. Then 
there's some that like to race for the money clothesline. One problem is that you have to hang on to your sled while you're picking the greenbacks. And sometimes the dogs get the signals mixed up and won't hold. Usually ends up in mass confusion. Meanwhile, out on the trail, the racers have 60 miles behind them and 10 to go. Say, did you ever try running on a pair of snowshoes? The women run a shorter race, so they come in over the finish line first. The month of April in the Arctic spells polar bear. We're going to go the same route back up through the Brooks Range as when we were wolf hunting, and then across another 200 miles to the farthest north tip of North America, where the Eskimo village of Barrow is located. We're going to be hunting polar bear for about a 100 mile radius out over the frozen Arctic Ocean. We check our planes over very carefully before heading back up north. A mechanical failure out on the Arctic Ocean would result in having to abandon the airplane. In case of trouble with both planes, our own chances of getting back would be almost nil. The Eskimo village of Barrow is located right on the northern tip of the Arctic coast. We land on a frozen lagoon that's near the village, and since we get some terrific windstorms up here at this time of the year, we chop some holes in the ice and put in some good solid ice anchors so we can tie our airplanes down good. This is a taxi service that's taking us on up to the hotel. And on the way, we pass a milepost sign that reminds us we're only 1,250 miles from the North Pole. Barrow Village is the largest Eskimo village on the Arctic coast. The government is presently converting Barrow into a modern Arctic community, proving that it is possible for man to live up in this frozen land. The new buildings are all of frame construction, replacing the old style sod huts. The ice usually opens up here in August long enough to get just one boat a year in. The village is setting on a natural gas field that provides economical heat and electricity. This church painted their sign on a whale bone. And this is the Top of the World Hotel, which will be our home for the next couple of weeks. It's not too modern according to what we've been accustomed, but considering the geographic location, it looks pretty good to us. Well, the next morning it was 46 degrees below zero, which meant that our batteries were so cold they wouldn't crank the engine over, so we had to start them by hand. Well, this is Guy Okaka, a 57-year-old Eskimo that's going to ride along with us today. Our first hunters aren't due for another day or two, so we decided we'll take a swing out over the ice and see what the ice conditions look like this year. The pull of the magnetic pole is so weak this far north that we have to use a special remote indicating compass mounted out in the end of the wing. Of course, there's no landmarks out on the ice at all, so we have to rely completely on the compass to find our way out find our way back to Barrow again. We set our course that we want to go out and climb up to about 2,500 feet elevation to clear a very rough section of ice that lays right along the shore. This is caused from the moving ice pack grinding against the solid shore ice, grinding up huge pressure ridges of ice as much as 50 and 60 feet high. So we stay up high enough that we could glide safely to either side in case of an engine failure. Then we head straight on out as much as 50 or maybe 100 miles until we find a crack in the ice, which is known as a lead. Then we drop down to about 400 feet above the ice and fly along these leads and look for bear or for bear tracks. The bear follow along these leads and hunt for the seal, which is their main food. Here we 
we see a small bear that's sitting on the edge of the lead waiting for a seal he can catch. So we fly on down along the lead, usually with one plane on each side. We see a fresh looking set of tracks. We'll drop down to about 100 feet above the ice and try to track him down. Well, we've picked up a set of tracks now. They're leading us out across the solid ice pack. You can see the tracks quite well when the bear walks over small snow drifts, but when he's walking on the smooth surface of the ice, the tracks are quite difficult to see. Most of the time, they'll lead us back into a jumbled up, broken up section of ice where we'll lose them all together. In this case, we're lucky enough to be able to track the bear down, but uh, he doesn't quite look big enough to be a trophy bear. Well, maybe we'll swing around and take another look at him. Whoa, wait a minute, what's this over here? Hey, here's three bear over here all together. Well, I guess it's just a sow and a couple of two-year-old cubs, so we're gonna let those go too. And the other bear isn't quite as large as we'd like to have for a good trophy bear, so we'll go back along another lead and try to pick up another track. Here's a school of beluga whales that we're playing in this lead. They're the smallest of the whale family up in this area. So then we fly on up the lead a ways and pretty soon we pick up another track. And this one looks quite a bit larger. But we're not sure how fresh it is. So we're gonna land and measure the track and have a little better look at it. The tracks do look quite fresh and also quite large. You notice they're about nine inches wide, which means that it should be about a nine and a half or a 10 foot bear. He's sinking into the snowdrifts fairly deep and dragging his toenails, which also indicates a very heavy bear. So we're going back in the air again and see if we can finish tracking him down. There he is. Find a flat chunk of ice about a half a mile from the bear where we can land both planes. We have to drag her in real slow with full flaps and then plunk it in right over the last rough ice and try to get stopped before we ski into the next chunk of rough ice. First sight we get of the bear, he's got his nose in the air trying to smell us out. Since they have no natural enemy, sometimes they hunt us at the same time we're hunting them. So we work around ahead of the bear and get up on a big chunk of ice where we can see good and wait for him. Unlike other bears, they also have very keen eyesight. He's getting in pretty close now, so we're gonna be set for him when he comes over the pressure ridge of ice right in front of us. Meanwhile nearby, Jack Lentford, who is in charge of the polar bear studies for the state of Alaska, is engaged in tagging polar bear. The bear are tracked down in the same manner as when we were hunting, except that a helicopter is used. A dart with an immobilizing drug is shot into the bear from the helicopter, which takes about 15 or 20 minutes to take effect. This tagging project is being done in cooperation with the other countries that border the ice pack. The main purpose is to determine if the polar bear circumvent the entire polar ice cap or if the various countries have their own polar bear population that migrate within their own offshore area. Once up to the immobile bear, a tranquilizing drug is injected into the bear to quiet the nervous system. A plastic ear tag with a number is then put into the ear. A color-coded nylon collar with the same number as the ear tag is put on so that the hunter spotting the bear can report its location, which gives knowledge on the migration patterns of the bear. Uh, this bear was a mother with two cute little three-month-old cubs, and now the cubs are coming around looking for their mommy. There has been a lot of adverse publicity from very ignorant, emotional people concerning polar bear hunting, and even making the false statement that polar bear are almost extinct. Our own Alaska polar bear biologists probably have more knowledge than anyone else in the world, and they do not agree with this. In the 12 years that I guided polar bear hunters, I could see no decline in the bear population at all. In fact, the hunters have been the greatest asset that the biologists have in furthering the research program. 
not only from providing the necessary funds through license fees and tax on firearms and ammunition, but also in bringing in reproductive organs, skulls, and blood samples, and reporting bear movements, particularly the tag bear. The same number is then tattooed inside the lip to put a permanent mark on the bear in case the collar and the tag are lost. The bear that you saw us take a few minutes ago for a trophy was a very old male of exceptional size that was beyond the reproductive age. I had him mounted full life size and is now in the Fairbanks Airport Terminal, giving people a chance to see what a tremendous animal they really are. The bear is then measured in all dimensions as are the skins brought in by the hunters to compare with the bear taken by the other countries. Hunting with proper management has proven to be equally as beneficial to other species as well as polar bear, not only from furnishing the necessary funds for conservation programs, but also especially the trophy hunter who tends to crop off the older animals, providing more food and habitat to sustain the younger animals. The polar bears spend their entire life out on the floating ice pack, and along Alaska, the females even have their cubs on the ice during the month of January. To establish an aging process, a very small tooth is extracted and put on file, and then a dye is injected into the bear that will deposit a dye layer on the roots of the teeth. And then the calcium layers deposited on the tooth roots over the dye during the forthcoming years will be counted if the bear is later taken. This will determine the length of time it takes for a calcium layer to be formed. A milk sample is then taken for later analysis back in the lab. The same number is then painted on the bear's back so that the hunter spotting the bear can positively identify it and report its location. The number stays on until the bear sheds during the first year. The bulk of the knowledge gained so far in Alaska has come from the guides engaged in polar bear hunting, who only harvest, for the most part, the old male animals. If polar bear hunting is stopped because of outside pressure from so-called do-gooder organizations, then the research program will also have to stop. As the bear begins to come out of the drugs, the biologist leaves so that the bear can regain back to normal undisturbed. During the summer months, Jack compiles all the data and analyzes the various samples brought in by himself and the hunters. During that year, the mother with her two cubs travel down the coast past the giant new oil discovery located here and then was spotted again 450 miles down the coast from where she was tagged one year before. This was the first sighting of a tagged bear that had migrated over a long distance. The cubs, now a year older, are given an ear tag only as they are still growing and a collar cannot be used. The cubs are not quite so friendly now as they were a year ago, so had to be given a light tranquilizer also this time. They will remain with their mother for at least another year before they're old enough to go out on their own. Twelve miles down the coast from Barrow is where Will Rogers and Wiley Post were killed, so we stopped by to pay tribute to these pioneer aviators. Will Rogers and Wiley Post, America's ambassadors of goodwill, ended life's flight here August 15, 1935. They were on their way to Siberia by way of Alaska and had missed Barrow as they went north. And then they had landed here in this lagoon to ask an Eskimo that was camped here where Barrow was. When they took off, they apparently iced up and stalled out and spun in and were both killed at this point. When we got back to the village, we noticed some of the kids sliding down the bank along the beach. This one has a tailor-made sled that shows much use. This one just used the seat of his pants, while this one had a piece of cardboard. Here's a couple that have a cardboard box, and they say, get out of the way, here we come. Notice the prize all wolverine fur rough around the hood of this little fellow's parka. This one just came outside, and his eyes aren't used to the bright sunlight yet. Notice the runny nose on this little fella, and this next one will show you how they wipe their nose. This is 
babysitting at the top of the world, big sister puts baby brother in the back of her parka and then puts a belt around the middle to hold the little guy up in there. Your grandma's going to show us how they get the baby in and out of the back of their parka. First time we took this, the little guy come out without any clothes on, so we had to do it over. water supply here is ice from a frozen over lake about four miles out behind the village. The ground's permanently frozen, so they cannot have any wells here. The ice blocks are hauled in and then stacked up around the back door. Of course, the stray dogs running around pay the same respects to this as if it were a real water hydrant. Now he's going back out for another load. You have to be a little careful walking around the village that you don't get run over by one of these things come around the corner. This is the top of the world Little League. In recent years, the motorized snow sleds have come on the scene in Barrow, and on Sunday afternoon, they all turn out for a big race. Uh-oh, here come the women drivers. Everybody stand back. Even though the snow sled is a terrific invention, it still can't replace the dog teams when it comes to going out on the rough ice to the whale camp. The camp is usually located on the main lead that opens up in the spring of the year and is sometimes several miles out. When the crew sees a whale coming down the lead, they get in the skin boat and go out onto the lead and try to head him off. They use the old solid brass whale guns that were used back in the whaling days before the turn of the century. The gun is eight gauge bore diameter and shoots a bomb that they try to put in behind the head that explodes inside of the whale. Then the next member of the crew drives a harpoon into the whale which is tied to a seal skin float by a long piece of walrus skin rope. Back in the early whaling days, the bowhead whales were killed just for the baleen that was used to make the stays for ladies' corsets. Each whale has a large number of these baleen located in the jaw that is used to strain the plankton out of the water. These are the giant black bowhead whales which will run up to 16, 70 feet long and they weigh about one ton per foot. While the crew is waiting for a whale to come along, they'll sometimes chop a hole down through the ice and then catch these little fish that they call candlefish. They say these fish are so rich in oil that after they're dried, they'll burn just like a candle. Then if they're lucky enough to get a whale, one of the crew members will run back to the village and put up the crew's flag and a pair of the baleen, which shows how big the whale is and which crew got the whale. Then the whole village will turn out for a big tug of war to try to haul the whale up on the ice. Then a massive butchering operation takes place, cutting the blubber off and cutting up all the meat. Then the whole village will put on their newest, brightest colored parkas and come out in a big circle and wait to get their share of the whale meat and to celebrate a nullica tuck. Then it's the crew member's duty that got the whale to cut it all up into pieces so it can be evenly divided. This is the blubber off the whale and the black edge is the skin. Then the choicest part of the whale is the flippers, which they call muck tuck. And I don't believe there's anything that an Eskimo would rather eat than muktuk. They all bring their dish pans out so they can collect their share of the whale meat. The kids eat the muktuk just like it was candy. Hey, I didn't get my share yet. Then they take a large walrus skin blanket with hand holes around the edge and have a blanket toss. 
the origin of this event is out on the whale hunt when they toss the lightest member of the crew up in the air as high as they can so that he can see farther out over the ice and see the whale coming. Here's one fellow that could even do somersaults. Here's one of our white friends trying it. Now watch this. Then they put the walrus skin blanket down on the ground and have their ceremonial dances celebrating the great success in getting the whale. The first dancers are the crew with their families that put the first bomb into the whale. Then the other whaling crews, along with their families, join in. Each one of these dances tells a story about the whale hunt. This attractive miss with her pretty new parka won first prize in the parka parade. As the midnight sun swings around to the northern horizon over the Arctic Ocean, we bid farewell to the Eskimo Nillicatuck and head our way back towards home. As we get close to Fairbanks, we see that the spring breakup is in full swing. The ice on the Tanana River is broken up and is jamming up now just below town. When the ice is completely cleared out of the Chena River that runs right through our city of Fairbanks, it signifies that summer is really here. Then all the busy summer activities get underway and things really begin to hum. We've seen winter lows here down to 72 degrees below zero, which is 165 degree contrast to the occasional summertime highs up into the 90s. One of the best things I like about Alaska is its fishing. I've just talked Leroy into taking me up into the Brooks Range now for some lake trout fishing. This is mid-July and the ice should be just about going off the big lakes. That's the best time for the big lake trout. The 24 hours of sunshine here in the summer really makes everything grow big. Here's Vivian's delphiniums that are eight and a half feet tall. Hey, come on, let's get going. Boy, it sure takes women a long time to get ready. We're going back up to a large lake in the same area that we were wolf hunting here last winter. We land on the beach of the lake and then set up camp before we go out fishing. You've probably heard many stories about our Alaska mosquitoes. Actually, they're quite friendly little guys. They hang around the door of our tent and greet us every time we come out. That occasional blur you see on the screen now and then is one of these little guys making a dive-bombing attack in front of the lens of the camera. Despite the mosquitoes, though, the Arctic is really a very beautiful place in the summertime. Here's our little ptarmigan again, and now he's got his brown summer coat of feathers on. We took our 14-year-old nephew up with us, and he's really chomping at the bit to get out and get at the fishing. The lake is completely frozen over yet, except for the shallow end, and the lake trout seem to congregate here around the inlet to feed on the smaller fish that are migrating up into the next lake. Hey, you gotta hook up the first cast. The fish takes to the air right away to try to throw the hook out. Sometimes the bigger fish lay right along the edge of the ice out where the water drops off deeper, so Vivian's gonna try to wade out a little farther and throw her lure out as close to the ice as she can. Well, 
her first cast brought a couple of follow-ups, but neither one of the fish would take it. In the meantime, David's about to land his first fish, and what an excited kid he is. Vivian made several more casts out closer to the ice without any action, and then all at once, she just about got yanked right off her feet. The drag on her reel was set for eight pound test line, and before she knew it, he had almost the whole 200 yards of line stripped out. It was clear out under the ice. Looks like she's able to work him back in a little bit now. David got his first fish in, which was about a 10-pounder. Then he went back out where Vivian was and soon had another strike. But the fish managed to throw the hook out right away. It wasn't too long, though, before he had another hook up. Vivian's been fighting her fish now for about 45 minutes and has finally managed to work him up into more shallow water, but it still looks like he isn't quite ready to give up. Whoops, there he goes again. Looks like she's got him pretty well tuckered out now and she don't want to take a chance of losing him, so she asked David to go out with a gaff hook and give her a hand and get him up on shore. She's been struggling with him now for one hour and five minutes, and her arms and wrists are just about as tired out as a fish is. In fact, the last few minutes here, it's been a little bit questionable who's going to win. Say, that really does look like a dandy. Well, we checked this one with the scales and found that he was 39 inches long and weighed just 30 pounds. We looked back up the valley and this is a sight we saw. It appeared to be a massive migration of caribou coming right down around our camp and the end of the lake where we were fishing. It was mostly cows and calves in the beginning of the migration, except for an occasional bull like this that seems to sort of help lead the herd. The deep game trails in the background here are from the thousands of caribou that have migrated through this pass over the centuries. At times it seemed as though the whole side of the mountain was just literally moving with caribou. It was raining periodically and the caribou were wet, and here you can see a chain reaction of them shaking the water off. We estimated about 10,000 head came through during this three hour period. Now we're getting towards the tail end of the migration and the bigger bulls are beginning to show up. Say, if you really want a trophy, take a pick out of that bunch. We staked our fish out on a rope to keep them alive until we're ready to go home. We have about 70 pounds of good fresh lake trout here for our freezer. It was a family of Arctic tern that had been nesting here close to our camp and they sure disapproved of us being here. The old ones would get angry and squall like crazy and come diving in and try to peck us on the head.
You know, the salmon run ought to be coming into Bristol Bay long about now. Let's say we sneak off down there and try it for a few days. Great. As we head south, we pass North America's highest mountain, 20,300 foot Mount McKinley. Then we go on down the coast of the Alaska Peninsula and then turn up McNeil River to one of our favorite fishing holes. Uh-oh, it looks like the bears have got here first this year. fishing license. Here, fishy, fishy, fishy. Some of them get about as excited as some of the two-legged nimrods I've watched. cameraman for dessert. There, see how easy it can be? No, oh, I guess he didn't want that one. That was probably a male salmon, and some of the choosy bears will eat only the females so they can get the eggs. The salmon rest in the quiet pools beneath the falls before making a mad dash to get up and over. This is where they're the easiest to catch with a bear. The determination and endurance to get up to the spawning grounds is almost unbelievable. <laughs> one that's almost making it, but not quite. I guess he ran out of water. These are the Alaska brown bear, sometimes referred to as Kodiak bear, which are the largest carnivorous in the world, weighing up to as much as 1,500 pounds. Well, I don't think all of our fancy fishing tackle could even compete here, so I guess we better go on over to another place. Well, here's a kind of a pretty looking place to spend the night. I guess we'll drop in here and set up camp. We had our appetite all set for a nice fat rainbow trout for supper, so Vivian goes out in front of the airplane and makes a cast while I'm getting the fire going. We 
she gets a hookup all right the first cast, but since there's about nine different varieties of fish in these waters, we're not sure whether it's a rainbow or not yet. Well, he's not really jumping like a rainbow, so it's fighting more like a lake trout or a northern pike or maybe even an arctic char. Yeah, it is a northern pike. Northern pike are pretty good eating in these cold waters, but we had our mouth all set for a rainbow, so I guess we'll let him go. Well, it's a 12 pounder. The northern pike have a mouthful of very vicious teeth and a big appetite. For this reason, the other species of fish usually stay well clear of them. So we're not too much apt to find a rainbow right around here close. So I put on the waders and took the flyer rod and went on out into the outlet of the lake. And it wasn't long before I hooked into something that really did act like a rainbow. At fast water, the rainbow really can fight. Meantime, Vivian is getting the rest of the camp set up and ready for the fish. Well, that's a pretty nice little rainbow. Oh, he wasn't quite big enough anyway. We ought to have one at least 18 or 20 inches long to make a good meal for us tonight. We're using our eight and a half foot medium action Garcia rod and our line is an HCH double taper. The streamer we're using, I'm not sure of the name of it, but it's a bright red color that has big beady eyes. Usually works pretty good down in this area. just the right size. Later on the summer here, it's not uncommon at all to catch rainbow up to 30 and 36 inches long and weighing 10 to 12 pounds. But we still prefer the 18 to 20 inches for eating. Man, that smells good. The next morning we went on up to the Brooks Falls and this is one of the few places that you can get a red sockeye salmon on a fly. Normally the salmon don't feed after they leave salt water, but after they fail several attempts to jump the falls, it makes them mad and they'll strike at about anything. It seems like they'll take about any colored streamer, but uh, we usually prefer the bright colors thinking maybe they can see it better in the boiling water. The salmon usually come upstream in small schools, and when a school gets to the falls, we usually don't have to wait too long before we get a hookup. The red sockeye salmon are terrific fighters. They have a remarkable endurance bred into them, which enables them to fight their way upstream to the spawning grounds. When you hook one of these babies, they really take to the air, and they spend about half their time out of the water trying to shake the hook out. We've kept track of it, and we found that they'll average about seven jumps per fish when they're on the hook. We've even counted as many as 11 jumps for one fish. They have a remarkable ability of throwing the hook out. You usually only land about one out of every six or eight fish that you hook. We started out with a six pound test leader, and the small ones were the only ones we were able to hold. This one is about as small as they come, weighing only about four or five pounds. We 
Vivian yelling for help, so I guess we better go give her a hand. Right now, we're getting the raspberries for not bringing a landing net. Come here, you slippery rascal. This is also a small female weighing probably four or five pounds. Here you can see a salmon making it up over the falls. Wow, we! He's out in the fast water, and before I could even slow him up, he stripped out all the line on the reel. Sure, good thing I switched to that 12-pound test leader. Hammered away at the end of the line for a little bit, and then all at once turned around and made a mad dash right back up to the falls. I just heard a big war hoop back up on the bank, so Vivian must have another one on. So I pulled in line just as fast as I could, and of course I got it tangled around my feet. The salmon eggs are hatched out in the early spring, and then the little salmon fingerlings go out to the ocean where they stay for three or four years to their maturity. And then when they're ready to spawn, they come back into the exact same streams that they were hatched in. In fact, we've even been told that they go to the exact spot on the same stream to lay their own eggs. And then after they finish spawning, they all die. Well, it looks like Vivian's fish managed to throw the hook out. We noticed a hungry looking audience gathering up on the bank. I kind of doubt if they approve of us taking over their fishing hole. This is one of the large male sockeye salmon that would weigh about eight pounds. It's usually about a 10 minute wrestle to land one of these in this fast water on a fly rod. Hey, this one looks like he means business. I think we better get out of here. stop is at a small island about 26 miles offshore. This is a summer nesting grounds for millions of birds. The most common are the cormorant and the puffin and the seagulls. It's also the breeding grounds for the walrus. The walrus use their tusks primarily for digging clams on the bottom of the sea, which is their main food, but they also get quite handy with them for fighting during the mating season. The Eskimos kill them for food, and then they make very beautiful carvings out of the ivory tusk. The walrus have a very heavy, tough hide, which the Eskimos use to cover their boats with, and then they also make rope out of it. They'll average close to a ton apiece, and some of these large bulls will weigh as much as 3,000 pounds. The feeling of fall is in the air now, which reminds us it's time to go out and get our own winter's meat supply. 
We do our fall hunting up in the Brooks Range, and Vivian decided she wanted to do the honors this year. On our way, though, we're, we're going to stop in first and see some of our good friends at Beaver Village on the Yukon River. Beaver Village is one of several Indian villages that's located on the Yukon River. These people pretty well derive their living off the land yet, primarily from the fish of the Yukon and the trapping and the other wild game in the area. Here's Johnny Sam checking his salmon nets out in front of the village. This is the peak of the silver salmon run, so they're really hauling them in now. He flays the fish out and cuts the backbone out of the fish and then makes cuts into the flays so they'll dry better. The salmon are used primarily for their own diet as well as for their sled dogs. Then they hang them out on racks until they're dry. A few miles north of the Yukon is a small lake where the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has been conducting a duck banding project. Here you can see the trap they've built in the water, and then the long fence running out into the end of the lake is where they herd the ducks into the trap. This is done during the time of the year that the ducks are molting and they cannot fly. So they make them swim the three miles the length of the lake and then on into the trap. Once in the trap, one of the fellows gets in a rubber suit and goes out into the trap and pushes a few of them at a time down into a catch pen at the end of the trap. The Yukon Valley with its 10,000 lakes is one of the major nesting areas left in North America. Then they put the ducks in gunny sacks so they can take them ashore to put the bands on them. Several different varieties of ducks that they catch here. They banded over 5,000 here in one week's time. And away we go. Now we're going on into the Brooks Range and then up Beaver Creek to where our headquarters cabin is located. Several years ago, we spent about a half a summer getting a little bulldozer tractor in here to grub out the runway you see on the bank of the river there. During the fall of the year, we leave our float plane based here and then use our four-place wheel plane to commute back and forth to Fairbanks. The little airstrip is only about a thousand feet long, which explains why we have to use a family cruiser with the oversized engine in order to safely get in and out of here with a heavy load. There's quite a few grizzly bear around here, so we have to keep heavy shutters over the windows while we're gone so they can't break in and tear the inside the cabin all apart. The accumulation of old moose horns around the cabin attract these porcupine in that like to chew on them. So we replenish our wood supply while Vivian is feeding her little pets. sure her little 30 out six is sighted in good before we go after the moose. So she fires a couple of shots and we find they're just about an inch apart and about two inches above dead center, which puts her on at about 200 yards. Then we spend the rest of the afternoon just relaxing around the fireplace in the cabin and keeping the old coffee pot hot. And then keeping a good sharp eye out the window for a moose to come by. Sometimes we're able to get our moose right here beside the cabin. 
This little bull come by late that evening behind the cabin, but he got all the way before we could get a shot at him. The next morning dawned bright and fair again, so we decided we we're going to get in the boat and go on down the river a ways and see if we can find the moose. So Vivian loads her little 30 out 6 and then bids farewell to the bullet she hopes will find its mark. The boat's 20 feet long with a four foot wide flat bottom and we have a jet unit on it with an 85 horse inboard engine. We had to build the boat out here and then fly out the engine and the jet and install it out here, which was quite a project in itself. With no propeller hanging down below the bottom of the boat, we can go where water is shallow is about three or four inches deep. We passed this young caribou as we went on down the river. About 10 miles down the river from the cabin, the river runs in next to a bluff where we can climb up and look out over the valley. In the summertime, the cows and calves stay along the river in the valley while the bulls spend the summers up in the higher country. Then in the early part of September, the bulls come down into the valley in search of the cows at the beginning of the rutting season. From a vantage point like this, we can sometimes spot the moose working up or down the valley. We notice a small bird diving in after a bald eagle that's circling around over its nest. These eagle have come back to the same nest for the past several years. We notice this year that they have at least one young baby in the nest. Then looking on down the valley, we can see a couple of moose here in the edge of a meadow about two miles on down the river. So I guess maybe we'll get in the boat and go on down there and see what they are. The design of the boat is typical of the shallow draft river boats used on the rivers in the interior of Alaska. With this jet unit, it'll do about 25 miles an hour. the opening you see in the right hand side of the river there and the meadow we saw the moose in should be about two or three hundred yards back in through the trees. So we go back in as quiet as we can and try to stay out of sight. We're up close to the edge of the meadow now. We don't see anything, so Vivian's going on ahead and get right up on the edge of the meadow behind a tree and get all set. So I think we'll give a bull moose call here and see what happens. Then we rub a stick through the branches of the tree and hit a trunk of the tree to try to make it sound like a mad bull moose raking his horns through the brush, sharpening them up for a fight. Vivian isn't too impressed with this procedure, but she's willing to wait anyway. First sight we get of a moose is an old cow pulling the willows down and eating the buds off from the end of them. So we keep a real close vigil with the binoculars and look for a pair of white horns to show up. Uh-oh, there he is. We've got his curiosity raised now, and he's coming on out to fight the other bull he thought he heard. He doesn't want another bull cutting into the harem of cows that he has rounded up. There's one of his companions that's staying close by him. There you can see the moose right on the edge of the trees across the meadow. Uh-oh, he's going back. Have we spooked him, or is he just trying to lead his cows back away? Well, we'll give him another call. We have to be very careful about calling now that we don't spook him. Well, apparently our calling is having some kind of a romantic appeal, because here's two of the cows coming over our way now. 
We have to be real careful now they don't see us. Hey, there's the bull coming all the trees again. Get ready. Oh. There's his same faithful mate staying close by him. Now if we can just get him out in the open for a good shot. We have to be real careful now they don't see us or hear us. Oh. You see his throat wiggling there as he's oh. returning our grunting call. Oh, oh, here he comes. Get set now. Hold it, hold it. Don't shoot. Oh, he's right in line with one of the cows now. In the next scene, you'll see the first shot go right in behind the front shoulder. Now keep an eye on the side of his neck and you'll see the fatal shot put him down. We got him. Even though it's quite a large set of horns, it appears to be a fairly young moose, so it should be pretty good eating. Also, he fell right down in a hole, which is one of the most undesirable places to dress a moose out. We have a little winch in the boat that we carry for just such occasions. Here's one of his former defeated rivals that's come in now to take over the harem of cows. So we butcher the moose out and cut it up into seven pieces and then put sacks on the meat so it'll keep it clean till we get it home. This is a hind leg which will weigh about 130 pounds and I might say a very good eating. And this is the part of the moose hunting we don't find too enjoyable. We've got about seven or 800 pounds of meat to lug about 300 yards over a rough swampy ground to get it all back to the boat. last trip out, we take the horns, which is the lightest load, but still weighs about 50 pounds. So we head on back up to the cabin, but of course it gets dark before we get back. Well, the next morning, while Vivian's still in the sack, I sneak out in front of the cabin to try to catch a few grayling for breakfast. The grayling are an excellent game fish and are native to nearly all the clear water streams in interior Alaska. Now I wonder what he would like to have for his breakfast this morning. Let's see now. We've already had a hard frost that's killed off most of the mosquitoes, so uh, maybe we ought to try a gray hackle. The grayling are not a very large fish, and a 20 inch is considered a pretty good size. But what they lack in size, they make up four numbers. Many of the old-time Alaskans would rather catch grayling than any other kind of fish we have in Alaska. They attack a fly with great vigor, and in the evening when they're feeding the best, you can catch one almost every cast. In fact, I've put on two flies and been able to catch two at a time. Sometimes they'll come boiling up all the water about a foot in the air and then grab the fly on the way back down. exotic fish and are noted for their large dorsal fin. They have a very sweet white meat and are considered by many to be our best eating fish. Whoops! Oh, he missed again. He must have poor eyesight. miss. There we got him. They also take a little MEP spinner real good. In fact, right after rain when the river is a little bit dirty, this is the only way we can catch them. It's about a number one silver MEPs.
get my hands on this one, we should have about enough for breakfast. Well, I cleaned them up and then fried them to a nice golden brown and was right in the middle of thoroughly enjoying them when I looked out the window and saw a bull moose crossing the river right by the cabin. Uh-oh, he's getting too close to our airplane now. I guess we better go run him off. Hey, get out of there. During the rutting season, the bulls have a very cantankerous attitude. And we've heard stories of cases where the moose have ripped their horns through the fabric of airplanes. Well, it's our typical luck to go a long ways down the river and work hard to get a moose, and then come home and find one right in our backyard the next day. Oh, yeah, I guess we better see how big Vivian's moose really is. We stretch the tape out and see it's 58 and a half inches, which puts it up in the trophy class. Of course, the horns won't go inside of the airplane, so we have to tie them out on the wing. Then we put about 400 pounds of meat in the airplane with us and blast off for town to meet our next hunters that are coming in. are coming on the Alaska Airlines jet from Seattle, passing Mount McKinley before the let down to the Fairbanks International Airport. With a new modern jet aircraft, it's possible to reach Alaska within a mere day's travel from almost any place in the world. We check over the fellow's gear before loading up for the flight back up to the Brooks Range again. The first fellow is Todd Sheldon from Antigo, Wisconsin, and the other fellow is Lee Minton from Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Their first target is going to be the white doll sheep. We have a very pleasant two hour and 20 minute flight back up to the Brooks Range. Then we land at Beaver Creek again, transfer all of our gear over to the boat, and then head on down the river about 10 miles to a place where we have the tractor parked. We then load everything into a small trailer that we have hooked on the back of the little tractor. Then we drive the tractor up the red-colored ridge for about another 10 miles into what we call the White Mountains. And this is the home of the White Doll Sheep. Driving the tractor here is Ted Baker, who is helping me on the sheep hunt. We go about a mile and a half to another small creek that we're usually just able to ford with a tractor. It had been raining hard during the night, and the water was higher than we thought it was, and when we tried to ford it, we got stuck. So we were quite thankful to have a winch on the tractor to pull ourselves back out of it again. So we dropped some big trees across the creek and built a bridge. It took us about two and a half hours to construct the bridge, and then we were able to go on up the hill again. The red color of the hills is from the fall season, changing the color of the leaves of the blueberry bushes. We get up the hill just in time to set up camp before it gets dark. The next morning, we take a scan around the hills from our camp, and we spot this bunch of sheep way up on the side of the mountain. Through our 20-power spotting scope, they appear to be rams. So I guess we better try to go on up there. And this is where the going really gets tough. We were trudging along up the side of the mountain, and all at once, this bunch of ewes come boiling right up out of the creek bottom. We froze in our tracks to try to keep from spooking them, and then eased down behind the ridge out of sight. Lee had a new pair of shoes that weren't too well broken in yet. His feet got hot, so while we're waiting for the ewes to settle down, he cools his feet off in this little cold spring coming out of the side of the mountain. We stay down behind the ridge so the ewes can't see us and then continue our trudge on up the mountain. When we looked over the first peak, we saw this little bunch of young rams right down below us. 
There doesn't appear to be any full curl trophy rams in the bunch, and we like to have at least a full curl for our hunters. So we just sit there and watch them for a little bit. The lower left-hand ram is almost a full curl, but not quite. It's very important we don't spook a bunch of rams like this because they could run over the mountain and spook the whole outfit all the country. So we take on a sandwich while we're waiting for them to move out of our way. About a half an hour later, they finally moved back into a draw where they couldn't see us, so we can cross on over to the next peak now. When we get up to the next peak, we look clear across the basin and find four big rams right on the skyline. Our 20 power spotting scope tell us these are the ones we've been hunting for. And there's the old granddaddy of the bunch. This is a real trophy ram. Well, they slid back down behind the ridge, so we had to circle clear around the head of this basin to come up on another vantage point above them. A shower crossed our path in route, and it took us about an hour to get over there. From this vantage point now, we should be above the sheep and be able to see the whole backside of the mountain. We noticed the four that we saw earlier have worked their way on down to a slide about 400 yards across from us and are about ready to lay down. Then there's another bunch right down below us, and there's a real good trophy ram in this bunch. Lee's going to try for the big ram over across from us while Todd is zeroed in on the big ram in the other bunch. Todd's ram was an excellent trophy, with the horns going about two inches past full curl with good sharp tips. Then the real grand prize is the one that Lee got, which is about four inches past full curl. This is a remarkable example of the white doll sheep. Well, we bone out the meat and skin out the heads for mounting and then start the long, weary hike back to camp. Well, that night we had a very delicious supper of fresh sheep liver and onions. The meat from the mountain sheep is the very finest eating of all the North American big game. The next day we went on back to our cabin at Beaver Creek and transferred to the Super Cup and then shuttled on over to a lake where we'd seen quite a bit of caribou activity. The float equipped Super Cub is a very versatile piece of equipment up in this area because of the many rivers and lakes that are dotted throughout the Brooks Range. We set up our camp on top of a little high knoll of ground down by the outlet end of the lake where we can look out and see in all directions. It's the middle of September now, and we're about 150 miles north of the Arctic Circle, so we can expect pretty heavy frost at nights, although our daytime temperatures should be pretty well above freezing yet. Looking out across the lake, we can see quite a herd of caribou over there that appear to be migrating in our direction. Then we notice a grizzly bear over there trying to catch one of them. Most of the caribou seem to be coming around the end of the lake that we're camped on. It about drove these fellows from Wisconsin nuts because they had never seen wildlife like this before. The outlet stream opened up into another little pond just below our camp and the majority of the caribou were crossing down there. But a few of them were crossing the outlet stream itself right at the foot of the little knob that we're perched on. The next morning, it took us about 45 minutes to spot the grizzly bear again. Looks like he must have killed a caribou last night, all right, because he's eating on something over there. Well, let's sneak on over there and see if we can get him. We'll have to be extremely cautious about moving in on a grizzly bear with freshly killed meat because they'll usually charge an intruder on sight. Easy now. He could be laying behind one of these willow bushes and try to jump us. Hey, I think I heard something right ahead of us. Yeah, there he is. Okay, come on, Lee, let's get him now. Here he 
he comes. Stop him, stop him. Oh, no. What a time to run out of ammunition. I've been charged by bear several times, but the closest call I remember was when a 1,500-pound brown bear laid in the brush and let us walk past him, and then he came at us from behind. He was only 10 steps from us when I stopped him. The fellow I was guiding didn't get his safety off, so he didn't get to shoot at all. If my shot had been about one second later, or if I'd had a misfire, it would have been real disastrous. I almost gave up the guiding business after that one. This is the caribou the bear had killed during the night. He had eaten all he wanted out of one of the hind legs and then covered it up to preserve it until next spring when he comes out of hibernation. This is another one of the remarkable mysteries of nature. After they've been sleeping for six months, they come out of hibernation and remember exactly where these meat caches are left. And we'll make a beeline right straight to them. This was about an average sized grizzly with the hide scoring a little less than seven feet. A very pretty hide, too. When we got back to camp, Lee had quite a bit to enter in his diary that night. Then he went out in our little rubber raft in front of camp and caught enough fish for a nice big fish chowder that night. We had a layer of ice in the water bucket the next morning, so this meant the washing operation was sort of brief. There's quite a few wild cranberries around our camp, so we picked a mess so we could have some cranberry syrup for our sourdough hotcakes. We forgot to bring a tailor-made spatula with us, so Todd had to cut one out of a piece of wood in order to turn our hotcakes over. Wild cranberry syrup and sourdough hotcakes. Mm -mm. After breakfast, we went out on our stand again, and we noticed there's still quite a few caribou crossing down below us. So I guess we'll go down there and see if we can get a couple of good trophies. Well, here comes a bunch now. But it appears as though they're mostly cows and calves, and the bulls that are mixed up with them aren't quite up to the good trophy bull that we're looking for. So I guess we'll let this bunch go on by. comes a bunch of bulls now. Boy, there's some big ones in here, but it's hard to decide which one we want. We see one little calf in the bunch that must be a straggler out of one of the earlier bunches. There's so many good bulls here, it's hard to decide which is the best one. Uh-oh, here comes the big one now down at the water. Of course, he's the wise old guy and must have hurt our camera because he's alerting the rest of them now and they're getting quite cautious. Uh-oh, now he's heading back. I guess Todd better take him while he's still got a chance. Lee has a nice bull picked out in the middle of this bunch, but he can't shoot because he's lined up with some of the others.
they should be spread out more by the time they hit that clearing up above the timber. Well, the big old bull that Todd got was an excellent trophy for the barren ground caribou of the Arctic. His one shot went in right behind the left front leg. Caribou had long beamed horns and double shovels, which is quite rare among caribou. Well, Lee's bull was also a very nice trophy, and while we were dressing it out up on the side of the hill, we noticed a grizzly bear down at the other end of the lake. So we take one final look to see if he's still there before dropping the rest of the way on into camp. Todd doesn't have his bear yet, so maybe we'll sneak up there tomorrow and see if we can get him. Back at camp, the fellas compare their two heads, which are both very fine trophies for the barren ground caribou. Early the next morning, we go up to the other end of the lake and we see a sow and cub right away, but they seem to be a little lighter colored than the bear we saw last night. Then we notice ravens flying around some small trees where the other bear might be guarding a meat cache. So we sneak on down in there behind some trees to try to get a little better look. There's the sow and cub, all right. Let's see now, that other bear should be right around here somewhere. Oh yeah, there he is. Both shots put him down, but it doesn't look like he's dead yet. Nope, there he's getting up again. I had to caution Todd not to walk up to the head end of the bear. You always want to circle around and come in from the back end in case they're not completely dead. It appears to be an enormous bear for a Brooks Range grizzly. The long prime fur down his back was about six inches long. We've been hunting the Brooks Range for a good number of years now and have taken many grizzly bear, but this looks like the biggest one we've ever taken. He had a huge head. Here you can see the well-worn teeth that's probably accounted for a good many moose and caribou. Here's the big ivory claws they used to dig the ground squirrels out of the holes. Todd took along his rabbit's foot and Lee's lucky cap that day, which paid off for him. Now if we can get him over on his back so we can skin him out, he was just like a big sack full of lead. Just about all the two of us could do to roll him over. We estimated he weighed around seven to 800 pounds. With these tremendously powerful front legs, they can roll over big boulders and pull out tree stumps when they're trying to dig out the marmots and ground squirrels. Well, the hide squared eight feet, four inches, which is the length and width added together divided by two. This is about a foot and a half larger than the average grizzly bear that we take up here. Of course, this also meant the hide was too big to put inside of our pack sack, so we had to tie the excess on the outside. Now, if we can just get up with it, we we'll start the long, hard walk back to camp. Incidentally, a hide like this will weigh about 100 pounds, so it's about all a guy wants to pack very far. When we get back to camp and can finally sit down and take that miserable pack board off, it really feels good. We'd been saving the sheep ribs to give our guests a little special treat there last night in camp. 
We think that barbecued sheep ribs over an Arctic willow fire is just about the best eating of anything we know of. They were also blessed with a very beautiful sunset there last night in camp. Well, we've just bid farewell to our last hunters of the season. So now what do we do? Yep, you guessed it. We're gonna take our self hunting. A couple of my buddies are presently driving down to the coast from Fairbanks, and I'm going to fly the float plane down and meet them here. Then we're going to hop on down and set up camp and fool around along the coast for a few days for a little relaxation for ourselves. When I leave Fairbanks, I have to climb up over the Alaska Range and then go through the coast range where there's many glaciers scattered throughout the mountains. And then I drop down to the port city of Valdez where hopefully my hunting buddies are waiting for me. Land in the harbor and when I find them, they've already arranged for a boat and are loading the camping gear in to get ready to go on out the harbor. The trio includes Jim Bischoff, and Bud Wheezy again, and yours truly. It was the middle of October and most of the bigger boats had been put away for the winter, so this was the biggest boat we could get. We headed out of the harbor and then out across the bay, but when we got out in the middle of the bay, the water got rougher than Dickens for this little skiff that we had, and this is no place to be swamped. So we headed over to the lee of some islands where the water was quite calm. Here we're meeting a fishing vessel that's on its way into the port of Valdez. Then we head on out through the Valdez Arm into Prince William Sound, and then on into a sheltered bay where we're going to set up camp and fool around for a couple of days. This appeared to be a high piece of ground, but when the high tide came in around midnight that night, we found out it wasn't high enough and had to get up and move camp in the dark. We all agreed that fresh salmon should be on the menu that night, so we run the skiff up to the head of the bay to where this creek was coming in. Jim was the first to connect up with the necessary item for the main course. We used the head and the other trimmings to bait our crab pot. Put the bait inside the pot and the crabs try to get at it by going through the little gate. Then a wire drops in behind the crabs so they can't get out. Then we drop the crab pot down on the floor of the bay and let out a line that's tied to a small buoy. And then let it work for us during the night. Back to camp, we satisfy our ravenous appetite and turn in for a good night's sleep. Six o'clock the next morning was supposed to be a three foot minus tide, so we get up early and go out to our clam bed and start digging just as it was getting daylight. The tide's coming in now, which is forcing us up out of the clam bed, but we're still getting pretty good digging. Smaller clams we steam for 10 minutes and then fork them out and dip them in melted butter, which isn't too hard to take. Then the larger ones we make into clam chowders. That's a cockle clam on the left and the butter clam on the right, which was what we got the most of. Yeah, they are kind of heavy at that. Well, before we go back to camp for breakfast, I guess we better go by and check the crab pot. Say, it feels kind of heavy. Well, look at there, we really did get some. These are the Dungeness crab, which are very tasty, but are nowhere near the size of the enormous Alaska king crab. Now with our larder well stocked with seafood, we go back and get the float plane and head on down the coast. Our object now is the Rocky Mountain Goat. In route we pass another fishing vessel. 
Back in the mountains behind the head of this inlet is a lake that we can land on. The lake is in a very beautiful setting, completely surrounded by near vertical mountains. This area is considered by many as the most beautiful part of Alaska and is often referred to as the Switzerland of Alaska. We chose to set up camp on a level gravel bar at the mouth of a creek that was coming out of the bottom of a waterfall. It's the first part of October now, and the Arctic we just came from is beginning to freeze up. But down here on the south coast, the weather is still quite mild. The roar of the waterfall lulled us to sleep that night and was broken only by the occasional thunder of the ice breaking away from the glacier at the head of the lake. But Jim is out first the next morning and has a bunch of goats spotted on top of a mountain right behind our tent. He says one of them went around the left side of the peak and two went around the right side of the peak and the rest of them went over the top. So after breakfast, we load up the rifles and get ready to go up and try for them. And we take pack boards along in case we're lucky enough to get a goat. Well, the steep sides of the mountains that were surrounding the lake was covered with very heavy brush and devil's club. It looked like the best place to go up the mountain was right up along the very edge of the waterfall. So Jim gets brave and starts up first. Bud waits down at the bottom to catch him in case he rolls off. Up at the top of the first falls, Jim waves, it's okay, come on up. Beautiful view from up here. So Bud and I start on up to join him. Stop at the top of the first falls for a rest and to take in the inspiring view of the water tumbling down over the rocks from the upper falls. Then the water rests momentarily in a deep green pool before tumbling on down to the lake. Once above the upper falls, the terrain levels off somewhat back for about a half a mile to a smaller lake that the water was coming out of. We noticed quite a bit of black bear sign in the area, and it was a very good crop of high bush cranberries that they've been feeding on. We had considered landing in this upper lake, but then decided not to due to the squirrely wind conditions in this canyon. We finally top out on the first ridge above the upper lake and spot a couple of goats up on the next mountain. They're moving around feeding, so we better not go any farther until they lay down. Then we can plant our stock without them seeing us. Like the sheep, they have eyesight equal to a man with six power binoculars. While we're waiting, we take on a candy bar to replenish our energy, and then Bud takes a little nap. Long about the middle of forenoon, the goats finally all settled down, but instead of bunching up like sheep usually do, they scattered out all over the mountain, which makes stalking much more difficult. We're well, right up in the middle of them now, and I'm going to try to get into a better shooting position on this one while Bud and Jim are crawling around to try to get in on a couple of other good-sized billies. I'm zeroed in on mine now, but I don't want to shoot until the other fellows are in position. Boy, that's a dandy-looking billy. Sure seems like it's taken those guys a long time to get over there. Looks like they're about set now, except in the meantime, the goats have gotten up and moved away from them.
Uh oh, here's a black bear. This is probably the reason the goats got up and moved. In fact, the bear's making all the goats nervous now. We're going to have to shoot pretty quick. taken off. I'm going to have to shoot. Well, Bud clobbered the upper goat with his first shot. Then he swung over and nailed the black bear. You can see the bear rolling down the mountain. And then over on the left side, you can see Bud's goat rolling down the mountain. Well, looks like Jim's having a little trouble. Well, they're both using 300 magnums, but the range is about 400 yards, so they still have to do pretty good shooting to connect. Right at his feet. Boy, you better get him this time, Jim, or he'll be over that ridge out of sight. There he got him. Well, all three billies are exceptionally nice trophies for the Rocky Mountain goat. Mine had nine and a half inch horns that measured high enough to be eligible for recording in the Boone and Crockett record book of North American Big Game. Bud's was the largest one with 10 inch horns and also measured up big enough for the record book. And Jim's was just a little bit short of being big enough to go in the record book. So he skinned out the heads for mounting and boned out the meat and started the 3,000 foot descent back to camp. Oh, oh, watch it, Jim. Packing a heavy load downhill is extremely strenuous on your legs and is very easy to lose your footing. Jim actually hurt his ankle on that fall. We were only about halfway back to camp when it got dark on us. And I might say that negotiating that steep drop alongside the waterfall in the dark was most breathtaking. We spent the best part of the next morning lounging around camp, resting our sore muscles, and reminiscing the success of the hunt the day before. Bud had to make one more trip up the mountain to get the black bear hide, so Jim and I broke camp and started to shuttle things back to Valdez. On the way, we swung by to take a look at the Columbia Glacier. The foot of the glacier is about two miles wide and is still sliding down into the ocean at the rate of three feet per day. The face of the glacier raises 400 feet above the water. And charts show the water depth here at 1,200 feet. down, these deep crevasses break open, dumping huge icebergs into the ocean. The glacier runs back up through the mountains for 50 miles. Here you'll notice a big chunk of ice is about ready to break off, and in the following scenes you'll see it falling.
From these tremendous ice fields on the southern coast to the midnight sun on the northern coast, we sincerely hope that you, our viewing audience, have enjoyed taking this trip with us through North America's truly last great frontier. Thank you. <laughs>